Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about hip functional anatomy. Uh, so getting a little bit deeper into some of the anatomical structures of the hip and discussing how things work together. Okay, so the hip complex is formed by the ilium, ischium, pubis, sacrum, and femur. Uh, so the pelvic bone is made up by the ilium, ischium, and pubis that are fused together. Uh, that forms a pelvic bone. Um, and then we, of course, have two pelvic bones to form the whole pelvis. Another term for pelvic bone is also coxal bone, C-O-X-A-L, coxal bone. Uh, so we have two coxal bones or two pelvic bones that form the entire pelvis. Uh, then, of course, we have the sacrum, which is where we have the attachment between uh, the spine and the axial skeleton to uh, the lower extremity. So the sacroiliac joint forms the attachment of the lower extremities to the trunk. Um, so the articulations, we have the pubic symphysis. Uh, that's that uh, cartilaginous joint. It's a symphysis type joint. Um, down between the two pubic bones, down in the inferior portion of the pelvis. Um, and we'll talk more about that soon. Uh, sacroiliac joint between the sacrum and the ilium. Uh, and the acetabulofemoral joint, of course, between the acetabulum of the pelvis and uh, the head of the femur. So the ilium, ischium, and pubis fuse during teenage years, but the ischial tuberosity and anterior superior iliac spine may not fuse until age 30. So we tend to think of the pelvis as being, or pelvic bones as being um, fused for our whole lives and being one big bone, um, but really they're named three different bones for a reason. So the ilium, ischium, and pubis, because they are separate bones, that um, fuse gradually over the years. And in our teenage years, the three bones are fully fused together. Um, but even so, we have certain uh, landmarks on all of our bones. This is not unique to the pelvis, but on all of our bones, we have certain landmarks uh, that are really attached to the bones that they're part of by cartilage and not necessarily um, completely solid bone at that point. Um, so that's what we're saying here is that the ischial tuberosity and anterior superior iliac spine are not finished fusing yet. So they're still, um, you're still sort of on shaky ground <laughs> until they're completely fused. They're still attached um, by cartilage essentially because again anytime we're going to build bone we put cartilage down first and then we convert that bone. Um, so they're still not fully fused. And that becomes important when we look at different pathologies and different injury mechanisms um, because an injury is going to cause a problem with whatever is the weakest tissue that is affected by that force. Um, so if certain landmarks or bones are not fully fused yet, um, then that's where there would be the weakest point and that's where that bone would be more vulnerable to injury. Okay, so the pubic, pubic symphysis is a relatively immobile articulation formed by a fibrocartilaginous disc. Now we say relatively immobile because it is not immobile. Okay, so there is some movement allowed there. So it allows some, a small degree of distraction, so like pulling apart, compression, and rotation. Uh, so it is amphiarthrotic, it is not synarthrotic. Okay, so it does allow a small amount of movement there, and then it allows more movement there during childbirth. So it can expand significantly to accommodate childbirth. Uh, that expansion begins in late stages of pregnancy, um, and then can, it can expand significantly during the actual act of childbirth. Uh, the sacroiliac joint is between the ilium and the sacrum. Uh, it's a combination of synovial and syndesmotic joints that allows gliding. Okay, so it's a synovial joint that allows gliding only um, and gliding in multiple planes, of course, uh, so that we can have full movement of the sacrum. Um, so what we're seeing in this top picture is a horizontal cross section so that we can see um, where the fibrous portions are and where the synovial portions are. So you see in the posterior part of the joint, we have the fibrous part, the syndesmotic part, meaning that it's joined together by ligaments. 
And then in the anterior portion is synovial. So it has a synovial capsule, synovial fluid, et cetera. Uh, the sacrum can slightly tilt anteriorly and posteriorly by only a few degrees. So a little bit of tilt back and forth, a little bit of movement side to side as the pelvis, because we know, of course, we know when we talked about in gait, the pelvis is moving significantly. It's moving up and down, front and back, and side to side. And so the sacrum needs to be able to glide to accommodate all of that movement. Uh, if it doesn't, if it becomes increasingly more fibrous, um, then that will restrict mobility. And then the lumbar spine has to make up for the hypomobility in the sacroiliac joint. Uh, so lack of mobility in the SI joint or dysfunctional movement in the SI joint often can lead to lumbar pain. Uh, so the joint, the entire joint starts as a synovial joint. So the fibrous part also, it's all synovial in children. And then as we grow and develop, um, the posterior portion becomes fibrous and the synovial portion sort of recedes and is only including the more anterior part of the joint. Um, and somebody who's very sedentary over many years that way, um, and as they age, the whole joint can actually become increasingly more fibrous, which is what I was referring to a minute ago. Um, so that synovial part, if we're not moving, like if the synovial joint um, is pretty sedentary and it, it can become more and more locked in place and that synovial portion will become more and more fibrous and lose its mobility. So it's important, of course, that we not be sedentary, but this is one of the many, many reasons why. So that does not have to be a normal part of aging, but that's something that happens with aging if the person is also not moving very much or correctly. Okay, the acetabulofemoral joint, that is our ball and socket joint of the hip. Uh, it's the strongest and most stable joint in the body at the expense of mobility. Okay, so it is very strong, largely due to the congruency of the joint. So the two parts of the joint, the two bones that are fitting together, are pretty congruent compared to other joints in the body. Like if we think about the glenohumeral joint, very incongruent. They don't fit together well at all. So it is very unstable and has a large amount of mobility. Here, it is much more stable and has much less mobility. Uh, it's primarily designed for locomotion, so the greatest range of motion is in the sagittal plane. So of course our human locomotion happens sagittally, so we have the greatest range of motion in that plane. We have significantly less in the frontal plane and in the transverse plane. Uh, the acetabular labrum, just like we have the glenoid labrum, it's a thick ring of fibrocartilage that lines the outer rim of the acetabulum, uh, deepens the acetabulum by about 21%. So again, makes the joint significantly more congruent, uh, so the bones fit together much better. It adds more surface area to contribute to the articulation, um, and that's largely what makes this joint so strong and so stable. And it makes sense that we want this to be very strong and stable because it has to be able to support our body weight and it has to be able to withstand very significant forces like when we're running or jumping and doing other activities like that. Okay, the femoral triangle is a triangle in the proximal thigh. Uh, it's formed by the inguinal ligament on the superior side. So that's the crease in the fold of your hip. So when you flex your, your hip where it creases, that is at the inguinal ligament, like we see in the picture here. Um, and then sartorius on the lateral side and adductor longus on the medial sides. So those three um, landmarks are forming this triangle in the proximal anterior thigh called the femoral triangle. Now we care about this, it is clinically significant um, because there are several very important structures that are relatively superficial passing right through this region. Um, so the femoral nerve, femoral artery, and femoral vein are all passing through here and again relatively superficially compared to other areas. They're also very, very large in this area. They, they taper and get smaller and branch off as we get more distal, uh, but they're very large right here in this area, which means that if they were damaged would have a significant harm on the body. Um, there's also many lymph nodes in this area that can be enlarged with infection or inflammation in the lower extremities. 
Um, so clinically, we care about this because it's important that we're careful about um, palpating this area or any kind of foam rolling or rolling on a medicine ball um, or just any of the therapies that we might apply, whatever type of modality that you might use. Uh, we want to always be aware that in this particular region, we have many very sensitive structures that, that would do very serious harm if we were to damage them. Okay. All right. Thank you for watching.